Okay, well, let's uh, let's begin, and I'm sure John will will join us in a, in a few minutes. So, welcome to this year' last session of uh, Renaissance Lives. Uh, there will be another um, uh, season next academic year, but this is the the last session today for this academic year. We started with Petrarch, and today we are really at the very end of the Renaissance with Newton, whose dates are 1643, 1727. And we will be discussing the book, Isaac Newton and Natural Philosophy with the author, Niccolo Gucciardini, who is professor of the history of, uh, of science at the University of Milan, and who is also a historian of uh, mathematics. Now, there are plenty of assumptions uh, about mathematics uh, as a rather hermetic and self-contained, if not monodisciplinary, discipline. Yet, if you look at the place of um, mathematics and the history of mathematics in the Warburg Library, and I'll show you the, the, the classification system on the right side of the screen, you will see that uh, mathematics intersects with questions of magic, of numbers, of games, of harmony, that they lead on to issues of prophecy, cosmology, astrology, and astronomy. And this is, of course, because the Warburg Library is a library of questions and problem rather than merely a collection of subject headings. And as you will hear today, these problems linked to the, the, the position of mathematics in cultural history are very much at the heart of uh, Newton's ideas and work, whose mathematics cover such a wide space ranging from um, <clears throat> visual and auditory perception to the history and chronology of the world or to the movement of the planets. Now, to explore these questions, I'm uh, joined, I'm very lucky to be joined by uh, Professor John Tresh from the Warburg Institute, whose research is truly interdisciplinary because it examines, and I read from his website, changing methods, instruments, and institutions in the sciences arts and media from the early modern period to the present, as well as examining connections among disciplines, practices, and cosmology. And I wanted to ask John to uh, put the first question to uh, Nicolo, but as I can't see him yet due to technical question, I'll just ask the, the first question to you, Nicolo. What brought you to, um, well, to write on Newton and what importance do you do you bring to, to the idea of writing yet another biography of Newton? Yes, thank you so much, Francois. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, um, okay, I, I first of all apologize for my broken English, but I hope that you will understand and hear me. Well, that's a very good question. Uh, why did I write this book? Uh, the, the short answer is for fun, because I enjoyed writing it, but I think I have to find a better answer, I think. So the better answer is that I have been working on Newton's mathematics and uh, Newton's Principia and uh, the reception of Newton's Principia for several years. And, um, you know, I met other Newtonian scholars at conferences and uh, there is a small industry, let us say so, of Newtonian scholars who have, uh, okay, who have recently reached uh, very important results on Newton's alchemy. Uh, Larry Principe and Bill Newman. Bill Newman recently published a wonderful book for Princeton University Press. Jed Barold and Moti Feingold have written a monograph uh, a few years ago on Newton's chronology, Rob Eilith, another monograph on Newton's religion. Not to speak about Stevens Nobelin and Scott Mandelbrot and other Newtonian scholars, Sarah Hutton and Sioana Wang are in the list of people who are listening to me in this moment. So I, Sarah, how, Sioana. Uh, so I thought that it was, uh, it might be, funny to uh, write, interesting to write a new short biography, making the general public aware of these uh, last developments that these scholars shared with me. Um, and, and there is also a challenge that, you know, Francois, you were talking about mathematics, uh, how to relate Newton, the mathematician, to the other Newton, so to speak. And, uh, 
there are very simplistic way to do that. And I wanted to avoid a simple generalization, but there is a sense in which we can overcome a division between uh, the two Newtons, you know, the Newton known uh, you know, before the great studies by Betty Dobbs and Karin Figala on Newton's alchemy, for example, or Frank Manuel's work on Newton's religion. I mean, the Newton, the mathematician, the Newton, the natural philosophers that uh, uh, is uh, well known. And this other Newton that emerged after a sale of his uh, manuscript in 1936 that, um, you know, uh, fostered an interest in uh, Newton's uh, strange world in a way. Now, Newton is a very technical. So Newton is a very technical writer. And uh, as a historian of mathematics, I'm dealing with the less technical part of Newton's work. In a way, I mean, people who work on Newton's religion or alchemy have uh, to learn a language and have to learn, uh, because Newton is very technical. I mean, uh, he, he's not like Galileo who writes for the general public or Descartes who writes, you know, the Principia saying, well, read it as a novel, no. When Newton does something, he is, uh, uh, you know, very technical. And so there is not a scholar at this moment who can cover all his uh, activities. And there are two tendencies. You know, there are people who think that we should study Newton's several intellectual endeavors separate one from the other. And, uh, you know, Bill Newman, who is the great expert on uh, Newton's uh, alchemy, uh, once told me, well, I have a colleague who is a chemist, but he is also an accomplished uh, brass player, and he plays for the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. But, uh, you know, he has two crafts, so to speak, and uh, it would be uh, absurd to try to, uh, to, uh, to relate uh, his uh, uh, playing uh, uh, a brass instrument, I don't remember which one, the French horn, let us say so, and, 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 and chemistry. Uh, so there are people who really think that we have to, in a way, balkanize Newton and uh, work on his several activities and perhaps later try a synthesis. But when you try to write a short biography, uh, you have to, 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 to attempt to um, somehow, Unify the narrative that avoids easy generalizations, and uh, and that's what I have uh, tried to do. What I the risks that I encountered are many. So I, I tried to, to 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 relate my work as a historian of mathematics to the work of these other Newtonian scholars, uh, avoiding what Bill Newman and Rob Eilif, for example. Uh, fear most, that is uh, easy, uh, simplistic generalizations. So the kind of thing that you say, well, Newton was a Unitarian, he believed in one God, and he found one law, for example, of, of gravitation. I mean, you know, this kind of um, simple things. Um, so what I tried to avoid is uh, our four sins, <laughs> let us say so. One, uh, is exceptionalism, if you like. So the idea that Newton was uh, exceptional, different from any of his contemporaries, certainly he was peculiar, but uh, he was uh, a man of his time, who, of his times, who lived what uh, Paolo Rossi called the other present of our predecessors. I mean, Newton is a strange, but uh, his contemporaries were strange. And uh, what he did, for example, uh, embracing some sort of heresy and practicing alchemy is not uh, strange, is not, uh, is not exceptional. So we have to place Newton into a context in which these things that Newton did uh, flow as uh, something that is a natural 
response to the anxieties, the problems of his age. Um, I, I try to avoid an emphatic view. Uh, you know, when, when we speak about Newton, I mean, there is such a long rhetoric about uh, Newton that uh, we tend to write in capital letters. For example, Newton practiced alchemy. And we, we often read that Newton was obsessed by alchemy or something, you know, it, 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 we, use, uh, he, we use very often a language that is a bit too emphatic, I think. I tried to avoid an isolated view of Newton, the, the, you know, the mind forever voyaging through strange seas of thought alone uh, of uh, Wordsworth. Um, you know, Newton belonged to networks and uh, some of uh, the most interesting things that my Newtonian friends found is that uh, Newton belonged to networks of alchemists. He belonged uh, to, he exchanged his ideas on church history and the Bible with other scholars, with other erudites. Um, and indeed, he was not alone as a mathematician too. I mean, it, we have done so little to study how Newton, for example, interacted with the mathematical practitioners active in London and uh, how their problems and their way of presenting mathematics shape his early work, for example. Uh, we did very little to understand how Newton complied with his teaching duties. And um, we have not very many, but we have evidence that Newton, for example, lectured on trigonometry in 1683 to a select company. And this is a manuscript which is in Lambeth Palace that gives us this information. Um, it is a manuscript in the hand of Henry Wharton in Lambeth Palace, for example. We have, uh, you know, letters from the professor, religious professor of Greek, Thomas Gale, to Edward Barnard in Oxford, in which he details Newton's uh, taking position against Descartes and more. Uh, and he refers to Newton as Newtonus Noster. As, uh, so, you know, in many biographies, you see Newton before 1696 as a solitary scholar and after 1696, when he moved to London as warden and master of the mint as morphing into, you know, um, uh, you know a, a public persona, but, uh, you know, there is some grain of truth in that, but uh, Newton was, uh, was not isolated. And then, um, okay, okay, see, so these, these are the three sins that I wanted to avoid. And, um, and uh, okay, and there is a risk, in a way, the risk is to be too deflationary. We risk to fail to understand how complex and ambitious his agenda was and how distant was Newton from a scientist. So um, these were the aim I set myself. It was much more difficult than I thought when I began <laughs> writing this uh, biography. And uh, these are, you know, the things that I tried to do with this little, you know, biography, which is addressed to, uh, to the general public. It is not, you know. <laughs> John, you have a question, yes. Yes, thank you, Francois, for the introduction. And, and thank you, Nicolo, for being here. And I just want to say thank you for this really fantastic book. The What you just said about what you were aiming to do and what you were trying to, to avoid really comes through very clearly. It's a very brief book, not, not super short, but you know, a couple hundred pages and a, a really a wonderful read. For people, I think, who, who don't know about Newton, it's a good introduction to what the big issues are in his life, as well as in the scholarship. And therefore, even for people who do know something about the period or about Newton as a thinker and as a scientist, there's really so much in, in here, which involves you giving a quick summary of 
some of the debates, some of the more recent discoveries, some of the new emphasis. And I think there's just an overwhelming judiciousness, a, a, kind, of, a kind of prudence in the way in which you present Newton um, to, to try to be true to the, to the actual facts, to be, to be true to the archives, to be true to what we can know and, and what we can't know. And I think that not wanting to be overly emphatic, I think it is, is, is very helpful to you. You wind up with the sense of an extremely complicated an extremely interesting and extremely curious and really remarkable figure who, who you can kind of understand why he had such an impact on his time and, and afterwards. Furthermore, you give us such a nice sense of what that impact was, the, the different eras of reception of Newton, the way in which he was seen in the, in the 18th century, then again in the 19th and again for our time. There are so many wonderful images in it, like in all of the, the works in this series that Francois put together, beautiful pictures, beautifully edited and presented. It's just a, a fantastic uh, accomplishment. I'm glad to hear in a way that it was difficult to do because it's it's done so seemingly so effortlessly. I'm glad to know that it, 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 it was hard to do because I can't imagine um, setting about to do it and doing it so well. So bravo to you and, and congratulations on, on this, this publication. And I see that it's already received a lot of um, really remarkable reviews recognizing its qualities. I think one of the things that's that's so striking is that um, knowing that you've come at Newton as an historian of mathematics originally, I mean you've written about um, the, the mathematical debates um, that preceded him, that he engaged in. You're trained by the great Ivor Grattan Guinness, one of the, the, the world's, the, the greatest historians of mathematics that ever walked the earth. Um, that, that specialization comes through very clearly in, in the work. You're able to explain some of the innovations that Newton was making with regard to the, the mathematics that existed already with Descartes, but also going back to the ancients. And yet you're able to show Newton as a much broader figure than simply a mathematician, to, to show the alchemy, to show the relationship to, to other kinds of scholarship. So I wonder if you could say a little bit given that the, the title of this series, Renaissance Lives, could you give us a sense in which we should think about Newton as a figure of the Renaissance? In what ways is he similar to the, the centuries, the couple of centuries before, um, in terms of relations to texts, in terms of relation to, to archives, to getting back to the original sources? In what ways do, can we think of him as, as being related to other forms of erudition that are very present at the time? But are there also, in addition, ways in which he's doing something different than, than other Renaissance scholars? So I, I just want to invite you to, to say a little more uh, along the lines of what you've already said, that he's very much, he's strange, but he's strange in a way that the whole period is. What makes him a figure of the Renaissance and in what ways does he differ? From, from others? Oh, that's, uh, that's a very interesting question indeed. Uh, thank you, uh, John, for your words. Well, you see, um, well, there are many strands that uh, relate Newton to, 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 to the Renaissance, actually. Uh, since uh, I am invited uh, uh, in an online format at the Warburg, certainly, natural magic is a tradition that Newton referred to that was significant to him. And he read extensively, since you are talking about tradition, as, a, as a, an alchemist, he read extensively the literature produced uh, in the 16th and early 17th century on alchemy, for example. So he, uh, th this tradition obviously meant uh, a lot to him. Um, okay, what's different? Well, perhaps the difference is that in between this uh, old tradition, uh, Renaissance tradition and uh, Newton, there is Descartes who offered a completely different image of nature and what natural philosophy was. And, and I think that in a way Newton used this tradition in order to articulate um, his position against uh, the mechanicism of, of Descartes. So he found the resources that allowed him to position himself against uh, Descartes uh, and uh, a view of nature as a clockwork, let us say so, and this he disliked. 
and as um, Sioana Wang has shown in her PhD thesis, and she is, I, I've seen her name somewhere, so as she has uh, shown, um, uh, there was a tradition in England uh, dealing with uh, active powers and with, you know, meta, not seen as Descartes as a passive extended geometrical thing, but as enlivened by active powers. And uh, Newton certainly related his ideas to this tradition. As a mathematician, uh, Newton also, at a certain point of his life, Okay, the, this, this uh, interest in this tradition was very early. I mean, it, it dates back from uh, the early 70s, let us say so. So if we move 10 years ahead and we are in the early 80s, we find Newton entering into another Renaissance tradition that is uh, the humanist tradition of recovery or divination, as uh, they said, of uh, ancient of texts by uh, the ancient Greek mathematicians, such as Papus, uh, Apollonius, and Archimedes. And uh, Newton began reading these uh, texts uh, with interest uh, because he thought that uh, he shared, you know, uh, okay, what Newton did with this uh, natural magic tradition is again typical of his age, you know, so he's not. Uh, Again, he's not strange. He's doing something that was in the air. Uh, that in a way, and in a different way from him, but it was in Cambridge with uh, Henry Moore and uh, Cambridge Neoplatonist, since uh, I've seen the name of Sarah Hutton somewhere. So I, I think I might refer to her work on this. But uh, okay, as far as mathematics is concerned, um, uh, okay, maybe you don't, not uh, all the people who are following me know it. So I, I, I briefly say that uh, uh, in, in Urbino, the, there was a school of mathematicians, uh, uh, Commandino, Guidobaldo del Monte are the main uh, characters who, produced editions of uh, many Greek mathematicians. One is uh, the, collect, uh, the mathematical collections by uh, a late Alexandrian mathematician, Papus, who flourished in the third, fourth century AD. And um, uh, Newton read, you know, the, these people who, uh, who belonged to this mathematical humanism, so to speak, um, edited these texts from uh, Greek uh, codices, codices. And, uh, um, and the interest was not only philological, it was also mathematical. I mean, it was interesting to see what uh, these mathematicians were doing. And it is in this context that emerged the idea that the ancients possessed a, a hidden method of discovery, um, um, a method that they did not reveal that allowed them to reach uh, these wonderful results. Uh, and uh, Newton in the early 80s uh, and in the 90s devoted a lot of effort to reading Papus, to reading some of Archimedes' work, to reading Apollonius, uh, since he was convinced uh, that uh, the method of the ancients were um, superior to those of the moderns. So they were uh, also aesthetic criteria entered into the picture. Newton began saying that the ancients had more beautiful, more elegant methods and so on and so forth. So um, again, this is a, a legacy of the Renaissance. I mean, that uh, Newton very much fell, belonged to this group of mathematical humanists, erudites who read the works of the ancients in order to divine their method of discovery. And in doing so, Newton discovered the new things, actually. I mean, he, um, he, he actually did a very creative work, but he conceived it as a, a rediscovery of the ancient methods of discovery in geometry. And again, there is an anti-Cartesian strand here because to, uh, okay, I, I summarize things. Descartes in 1637, uh, wrote uh, La Geometrie as an appendix to the Discours de la Méthode. 
and uh, in, in this work in which he applied equations to the study of curves. Uh, and uh, in a very anachronistic way, we say that Descartes founded analytic geometry. This is uh, garbage, it is not true, but in a, he, I mean, he used algebra in order to study curves, uh, plane curves. Uh, and um, Descartes in the geometry writes, I have a new method, you know, uh, uh, this is not the method of the ancients. It is a new method. If the ancients had a method of discovery, they wouldn't have written such long works in which they find new theorems and construct new problems by chance. They have, they don't have a method. I do have a method because I have a method in philosophy, but I have a new method also in mathematics. And for Newton, this was anathema. I mean, when he writes, about Descartes, the mathematician, uh, his words are very, very uh, strong. He's very critical about Descartes. Descartes' method provokes nausea, you know, uh, uh, is a play of symbol, lacks elegance, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, again, you see, Newton in this way is uh, um, a late representative of this uh, tradition, which is a Renaissance tradition of rediscovery of ancient mathematics in which philology and uh, a theoretical interest in what the ancients were doing, uh, you know, are intertwined. But uh, very much as in the case of natural magic, if you like, to, 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 uh, if you like, uh, Newton here is playing, using this tradition in order to distance himself from Descartes, mm -hmm. from the recensiores, from the man of recent times, because he, you know, he, has a, the, he begins to look at the past also as a mathematician. If, yeah. I, can, if I can take up uh, John's question just a little further, one very strong leitmotiv of your book is that he really disliked the world of Francis Yates, the world of the hermetic philosophers and Kabbalists, but at the same time, he's looking for a Prisca Sapientia and Theologia. Isn't it one way in which he, he answers Renaissance question with modern tools? Yes, yes, uh, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> you refer now to something that uh, Newton developed in the 90s in the context of, uh, uh, you know, an extensive effort that he made to revise the Principia because strange as it might appear, Newton prints, uh, publishes the Principia in 1687. Uh, you might think that he is, he is happy and uh, uh, I think that many of us would be happy to have written <laughs> the Principia, but uh, he began, uh, you know, restructuring and rewriting it from scratch. He didn't like it. And uh, so in the 90s, he devoted a lot of effort to that. And in this context, he planned to include what are known as classical scholia, that is to say, writings in which Newton attributes uh, to the ancient Pythagoreans, to Democritus, uh, to, to, yeah, mostly to the, Pythag to the Pythagoreans and to Democritus, uh, um, a natural philosophy that was superior to compared to the Aristotelian one. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, this, uh, this idea of a Prisca Sapientia is also uh, something that has uh, Renaissance roots. At the same time, uh, there are aspects of the Renaissance tradition that uh, Newton disliked, and uh, and uh, you know he he disliked uh, uh, you know for example animism or a kind of mysticism that was ripe in certain uh, Renaissance authors. Uh, this was something that uh, Newton disliked. And uh, so, yes, in some of his manuscripts, he speaks against uh, Hermeticism and, uh, and, uh, and in some of his uh, theological, theological religious works that he produced, 
uh, later in his life, he distanced himself from uh, certain form of Neoplatonism. And uh, so, um, but you know, the, the Renaissance tradition is a very plural tradition. And uh, so, um, uh, you know, uh, Newton positioned themselves against the certain strengths of, of, of the Renaissance tradition. And this is important because there is some literature in which he is associated with, uh, uh, with um, some strengths of the Renaissance tradition that are alien to, to his, uh, you know, uh, to his uh, mentality, to his, uh, to his uh, way of, of, of understanding. Uh, I think John wants to intervene, yes. yes. If I may come in, I think this, this is a point, this is kind of the two Newtons that, that are out there that I, I do, it's, it's, it's quite interesting to see how they weave together. I think it's remarkable the point you just made about his connection to, Renaissance, to, to mathematical humanism. So th there's a tendency to say that uh, it's, it's entirely plausible to find ethical teaching or metaphysical teaching, broad philosophical notions in the works of the ancients, but rather surprising to hear Newton discovering or, or reclaiming mathematics from the ancients. Usually it's the new sciences which are seen as the, the limit to that kind of humanistic rediscovery. But in fact, he, he looked to the ancients as, as sources for his mathematics as well. But you're also pointing out that there are elements of that, the, the rediscovery of certain ancient teachings that he rejected, particularly some of those that are, have, been, have been called hermetic um, or other terms. I, but I, I, I have this lingering question and I know you address it. So I'm curious, I, I would like you to just to take your, um, to hear your, your view on it. There are many elements of Newton's writings at various points that do seem to bring a certain kind of animism forward. When he writes about the ether, he this seems to be a kind of a, a living force that 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 connects all things. He speaks about a, a vegetative spirit in some of the alchemical writings. He talks even when he's talking about the corpuscularian philosophy, he he uses the language of seeds that the that there are there's a kind of living seed that that generates the the corpuscles or that is are the corpuscles. How do you reconcile these 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 animistic or vitalistic um, uh, for figures of speech or, or or ways of writing, with your sense that he he really wants to distance himself from at least uh, some of the elements of a of a hermetic and sometimes Neoplatonic view of the world as as animated by a soul of the world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I, I don't have a, actually, a, I must say that I don't have a, a convincing answer, but I will try to, to say something <laughs> and, and, and let's see where I end up. Um, you know, when you read uh, Newton's early notebooks, you find uh, that uh, he's very much interested in, uh, in uh, phenomena such as perception, volition, memory. Uh, he, there are also entries in his commonplace books on the relationship between soul and body. Uh, so, I mean, uh, I think that uh, Newton was, uh, was uh, interested in understanding what we would call the phenomena of life. You know, um, we tend to see Newton as a person, as a a great scientist who worked on physics, on matter and gravitation and how the planet and the comets move and so on and so forth. But something that fascinated him and, uh, you know, the eye that I see behind <laughs> Francois is an example, a early example of how Newton <laughs> tried to understand the sight, the vision, how we see things. Uh, so the phenomenon of colors was, was not only something that happens there in nature, and I want to understand light, it was also the, the problem of perception. And, uh, uh, you know, these uh, things that Newton wrote about uh, the ether, the vegetative spirit, uh, a more subtle chemistry, and, uh, uh, yeah, I think that uh, they are related to specific questions that he had about um, 
vision. And here uh, you see uh, what uh, Newton did when he was young. I mean, he used a little uh, thing. I don't remember what's the name of this thing in order to stimulate his, uh, 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 you know, his eye from behind and he could see colors by doing this. Of course, it's a very dangerous thing to do. But uh, this is, uh, this gives you a, an idea of how interested was Newton about uh, uh, what uh, causes uh, the, the, you know, vision, uh, the, the sight. And um, so I, I, I have the feeling that one of the, the reasons why Newton uh, was interested in all the things that you said about uh, matter as endowed with uh, powers is related to his interest about uh, vegetation, corruption, and uh, these things. I mean, it's a strange thing when you see a tree and you see the flowers that get, I mean, it's a strange thing indeed. And, uh, and uh, Newton had, you know, specific, you know, he, he was uh, from the very beginning uh, curious about, uh, you know, I see you and then I go away and then I remember you, but what's, uh, what's memory, what's, what's mm. happening here? So he was asking himself, this kind of question. So I, what I can tell you, I mean, it is not a complete answer to your, to your question, but uh, what I would suggest is that, uh, uh, is that uh, Newton was, uh, was, uh, was very much uh, reading the, um, you know, uh, about the contemporary theories of uh, uh, perception and volition, how we, how we move, we move yeah. muscles and so on and so forth. And, okay, this is a bit deflationary. Is there any religious thing here? Well, yes, because uh, after all, we are talking about what is life, uh, how soul relates to body, how God relates to nature. But uh, in general, especially as far as God and nature, Newton was very minimalist. I, I mean, especially at the end of his life, he, he, he took a position according to which the less we say about how God intervenes in nature, the better. I mean, mm -hmm. so he was, uh, you know, uh, he had this idea, but, you know, I don't, I don't think I answered your question. Well, it, it, I thought it was very helpful and suggests that we think of Newton as a kind of psychologist as well. I mean, that yeah. how does the mind work? How do perceptions work? What role does will play? I think that's a very interesting um, line line of thinking. And as you turn to the question of religion, I think that's another remarkable achievement in the book that you're able in few words to, to give some sense of no, the complexity. I, I, I was helped you know, by, by Rob Aif and uh, Steven Snowden. I didn't bother Scott Mandelbrot, but his, uh, his presence is there. Uh, he is too much a friend of mine, so I didn't send him the book because I, know, I, I didn't want to, to, to pester him with that. Uh, well, but well, fair uh, enough. So you're, you're benefiting from their, their actual reading, but also their texts. Scholars who have yeah, yeah, tried yeah, to yeah. make sense of Newton as a religious thinker, try to put him in his context. I wonder, for the, for the audience here, what, could you give us a sense of, of where you understand Newton to, to be positioned? In this, in this century where there's so much war over the correct interpretation of scripture between yeah. high Anglicanism and, and Puritanism, uh, Catholicism. And at one point you mentioned this, this monstrous doctrine of the Trinity that he has some serious problems with. So what, what, who, how do we make sense of Newton as a religious thinker, both as someone connected to current in the time and as, as an innovator? Yeah, now I hope that the connection will, you know, will be interrupted now so that I can, uh, I can avoid that, <laughs> to answer this question. No, but I tried to, to give an answer to, uh, to this question in my book. No, first of all, there is a problem of periodization. We know that in the 90s, Newton, uh, we, certainly in the 90s, Newton began thinking about uh, several things about the Trinity, 
uh, about uh, the corruption of uh, the church at the, at the Council of Nicaea. So he began, uh, you know, studying in a very erudite way the, the history of the early church. And as you said, he, uh, he became convinced that in the year 325, uh, the devil had uh, used Athanasius in order to introduce in uh, Christianity uh, a metaphysical monstrosity. Uh, the idea of the Trinity uh, as, you know, red, in the term of uh, the three persons who are co-substantial, co you see. So it is a very metaphysical idea that Newton identified as, uh, you know, something that belonged to uh, a neo form of Neoplatonism, the idea of uh, the emanation of being and uh, was there in his opinion. So, so Newton, you know, in, in, in the 90s, on the wake of the Glorious Revolution also, I mean, there were many people who were, you know, debating the Trinity and Newton, uh, you know, was very much influenced by, by this uh, climate of, uh, of uh, um, uh, you know, um, close analysis of this uh, dogma. Um, so, in his opinion, uh, metaphysics had, had corrupted the, the pristine religion and uh, had offered a metaphysical idea of God that corrupts our moral relationship with God. God is a ruler, God is, uh, and we are his servants. And um, um, we have to relate ourselves to God as the servant to the Lord, and we have to worship Lord, uh, God like that. Christ is divine, but is inferior to the Father. And, uh, and so th this is what uh, he, he thought about uh, the Trinity, and I think uh, that he did so in the context of this extended debate about uh, about uh, this dogma that uh, was, uh, you know, uh, right in his uh, in his uh, in his uh, period, I think. But if, uh, if I can come in at, at this point, one thing that I find very striking about your book is that when you explain um, Newton's demonstration, after mathematics, there has to be a God. So God is very very much present in his uh, system mm -hmm. of the world. So. There is a theological debate, but there is God as part of his uh, mathematical proofs. That's a very good question, Francois. That's a very good question. Actually, uh, what happens is that, um, okay, when, uh, when uh, Newton published the Principia, okay, in the Principia, God uh, is referred uh, only once uh, in relation to the densities of the planets and uh, and perhaps in relationship with the stability of the stars. So, uh, so there is not much, uh, much about God in the Principia. After all, uh, being a, a work published in 1687, what is striking is, uh, is uh, how cautious is Newton not to speak about God in the first edition of the Principia. But then, uh, you know, steps in uh, Bentley, a uh, young, uh, you know, uh, and very uh, uh, promising uh, theologian and asks Newton a few questions and Newton begins to frame as a reply to Bentley. So it's interesting that Newton is, uh, is uh, engaging into this uh, discourse uh, you know, in, in a discursive context, uh, as a reply to this young theologian. I have the feeling, you know, I cannot prove it. I, I will not write it, but I will share with you this idea that I have the feeling that Newton was a bit worried because Bentley, you know, was a protege of Stealing Fleet. And uh, he was asking Newton theological questions emerging from his reading of the Principia. And the Principia is a work 
in which, uh, well, there is a law that governs uh, the motion of the planets, there is void. Mm. So it's a, it's a system uh, that uh, reminds, uh, so to speak, uh, a kind of, of, uh, of uh, if you like, Democritian system. And, uh, uh, so it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I think that Newton might have been either worried by Bentley or interested in getting in touch with him and uh, and uh, replying in such a way that he could respond to Bentley's questions. So Bentley, why was he approaching Newton? Because he was uh, preaching the Boyle lectures and uh, Newton, uh, he was asking Newton to provide him with uh, um, natural philosophical arguments in favor of uh, the existence of a deity. And uh, Newton replies, ah, I'm so happy that you asked me that because I, when I wrote the Principia, I had this in mind. We don't know if this is true, but uh, that's what he writes. And uh, what's interesting about uh, Newton's natural philosophy is that uh, contrary to what uh, Descartes had done or what Hobbes had done, uh, what Newton does is that he builds up a natural philosophy in which there is gravitation and therefore the stars should collapse in the center of mass. Mm -hmm. The planets attract each other and these mutual attractions of the planets might generate motions in the planetary system that could disrupt the order of the planetary system. Matter is done ultimately of uh, uh, particles which are hard. And when these particles collide, they do not rebound because they are hard. They don't, they don't have an internal structure. They are not like springs. They, do, they don't do yoop, yoop. They do this. They, and so Newton says that there is a loss of motion, he says. We would say there is a loss of kinetic energy, we would say. So uh, the natural philosophy that Newton builds uh, is a natural philosophy that um, doesn't prove the existence of God, otherwise we would be dazed here, but is a natural philosophy that contrary to the clockwork of uh, Descartes and uh, the, the, the best of possible worlds of Leibniz, is you know a view of natural of, of the world as requiring a divine intervention, a reformation, and uh, so uh, Newton provided Bentley with this idea that the best natural philosophy, which is of course the Newtonian one, provides an image of nature as something which is not independent but requires. Um, the intervention of a providential God. Uh, of course, it, it, this is not proved because otherwise we would revelation would be useless. I mean, we could be we would be able to prove the existence of God, which is uh, not correct. But uh, it is a natural philosophy which is open to the idea that a providential God can. Uh, can exist and uh, and uh, and uh, a, 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 as the actor who intervenes in nature and 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 uh, restores motion the stability of the stars and uh, the order of the planetary system so you see it's very very interesting and those those last pages on bentley and the way the role of providence in your book are extremely useful and very very, very clear yeah. Uh, there's a theme running through the book that I think is quite important to you in your sense of Newton. We've been talking a lot about his ideas and his scholarly practices, but he's also for you, someone very concerned with practical matters. You talk about measuring barrels, you talk about his time at the mint. Could you give a sense of, of how Newton, um, despite the, the theoretical accomplishments and the great amount of time he spends 
thinking is involved in a world that's changing, a kind of technical world, a commercial world, a world where um, industry is, is playing a new role and what he sees yeah, yeah. mathematics contributing to that. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, to, so I like very much uh, your question because uh, something that I like very much uh, to do, uh, to think, uh, well, something that amuses me is to think about Newton as a person who was um, as a mathematician who was very much involved in uh, uh, practical matters. I mentioned at the beginning his relationships with gaugers, with uh, table makers, uh, and uh, with uh, people like John Collins, Michael Derry, John Smith, uh, um, another guy who confusingly is, is called Newton. <laughs> but um, um, so uh, and it's interesting to see, you know, we, we see Newton as the discoverer of the calculus, as the discoverer of something that belongs to pure mathematics. But it's interesting to see how deeply rooted in mixed mathematics Newton was. I mean, his early manuscripts are manuscripts in which... Uh, um, I have one here. It is, uh, you know, additional for... Thousand, uh, it is not in the UL any longer. I, I took it with me now. So this is an anastatic copy of uh, additional 4,000. So if you leaf through this little pocketbook that Newton, uh, that Newton used in uh, 1664, 1665, uh, you find, uh, you know, mechanism for grinding, lenses, uh, you find the sections on music, you see, oh wow, wow, here we go. You find sections on music like this. <laughs> um, so this is my personal copy of additional 4,000. So I, you know, and, um, um, and so it's interesting to see how Newton belonged to this tradition and how um, of mixed mathematics and how his uh, way of writing mathematics was tailored to the way of writing mathematics of these practitioners. So, you know, when Newton's mathematical works were published in the 18th century, I mean, there were mathematicians who could not believe. I mean, Gabriel Kramer, you know, a Genevan mathematician says, I, I read this work by Newton, but uh, it is a, a scandal. He doesn't prove anything. I mean, uh, but um, John Collins and Michael Derry were not up to proving things. They were exchanging rules, you know, and, uh, and uh, this is, you know, so the mathematical culture to which Newton belonged is very much oriented to finding rules in order to find the volume of a barrel or, you know, building a logarithm table and this kind of things. And also the disciplinary boundaries of mathematics that Newton uh, accepted when he was young was uh, that of the mixed mathematical tradition. I, the second example, sorry, when I talk about mathematics, I tend to be a bit too, uh, too, uh, too uh, loquace, as we say in Italian. Uh, I speak too much. But uh, another thing that I would like to say is this. In 1702, Newton publishes uh, a book entitled Theory of the Moon, uh, Theoria Lune in Latin. There is a Latin and an English uh, version. And in this book, uh, this little booklet, Newton um, uh, tries to solve the problem of uh, predicting the motion of the moon, which is a way to solve the longitude problem. So uh, to have a lunar tables, if, you, if we have lunar tables, we can solve the longitude problem. And in this book, Newton uh, deploys um, a different and an epicycle model. So <laughs> he doesn't use gravitation. He, he uses techniques uh, that uh, he derives from Horrocks. So, so and, and, and again, we ask ourselves, but, Listen, Newton is a great natural philosopher. He's the founder of gravitation theory. Why is he using a different plus epicycle model in this theory of the moon? This is crazy. And um, the great Newton's scholar, Tom Whiteside, uh, who is, uh, you know, 
the, one of the great, uh, greatest historians of uh, science of the last century, wrote uh, a beautiful paper on, on Newton's theory of the moon, which is entitled Newton's moon theory from high hope to disenchantment. Because Whiteside reads the theory of the moon as a failure. I doubt that Newton considered it a failure. He published it. Uh, he was very cautious about publishing things. And uh, I think he was proud of a result that uh, allowed the construction of lunar tables well, by means of uh, you know, a technique uh, that uh, was uh, shared by astronomers uh, of uh, his time. So he didn't use gravitation theory, but he used a very practical way to solve the attempt to solve the, the problem. So uh, these are two examples that uh, show us that Newton's mathematics uh, can, should be placed into context and, and is um, remote from, from our world. It is another present, let us say so, uh, also Newton's mathematics. It is something that is distant from what Newtonian mathematics became in the 18th century, you see. When, that's, that's fascinating. So it's not just that his own mathematics could be used for practical ends. He actually borrowed the mathematics, which wasn't quite up to his level of sophistication for his own methods when he was communicating uh, useful useful mathematics. Yes. That's fascinating. Um, I'm, I, we're very soon going to open it up to um, to questions from the, the everyone who's here. We welcome any kinds of questions from anyone. Um, we invite you either to, to raise the hand. If you go under reactions, you can raise your hand. That's a way we'll know that you have a question or you can put a question into the chat and we'll read it out and let Nicolo respond to it. Um, while you in the audience are getting your, um, get, thinking about what you might want to, to ask either about the book or about, about Newton or, or his, his time, I'll, I'll just leave you with one more question for now. Although of course, Francois and I can keep going. What are your thoughts now having spent quite a lot of time with Newton and his papers? And this is an issue that comes up quite a bit in the, in the historical writing. What do you think of Newton as a personality? What's your sense of him as, as a person? Yeah. You see, this is additional 4,000, my copy. It is, it is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they cut it. Uh, you know, unfortunately, these people who did it, uh, they, they, you know, they, they cut here and, and it is round here. So they ruined everything like this. So, what about Newton as a personality, as, as a persona? Ah, what a difficult question. That's uh, something that as historians, uh, uh, it's difficult to do because uh, I'm all, often asked uh, this question, was Newton, uh, how was Newton? Uh, the best uh, answer is uh, that we don't know. We don't know, uh, you know, uh, we know very little about, uh, about uh, how to write in a, in a, in a uh, informed way about his character. I, I can tell you what he was not. He was not mad. You know, people relied upon him. Uh, and, uh, you know, he acted, uh, you know, as a, as a very responsible person in several occasions when he was asked to teach, he taught. When he was asked to be a member of the parliament, he was reliable. When he was the master and the warden of the mint, he performed his duties with um, efficiency. Um, you know, there are, you know, people such as Winston who say very bad things about his character, Plumstead, for example, but uh, they are not objective uh, observers. So um, my, my answer is that I don't know. Uh, I would like to have, uh, you know, a time machine and travel back in time. What I can tell you is that I would be very surprised uh, because, you know, we travel in space, you know, we buy something like this. You know, we, buy, we buy a Lonely Planet guide. And then uh, we visit a country. We go to India or we go to, to South Africa. And when we 
we learned there, notwithstanding uh, the fact that we read books, uh, always surprises us. I mean, the Indians do not behave like Indians should behave, and uh, the Japanese uh, do not behave as we expect them to do. So uh, traveling in space is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is often something that surprises us. If we could travel in time, I think that we would encounter a Newton that would surprise us very much and would be very different from the image that we have built. Okay. Thank you, Nico. <laughs> I think we, sh we should give also our audience a chance to ask questions. There's a question from Max Brecher, whom I have just asked to unmute. So, Max, if you want to. I, uh, I just did. Okay, well, uh, congratulations. What a beautiful, uh, a very thrilling presentation which is quite usual from the Warburg Institute. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Francois, and thank you. Uh, great, super. Uh, I'd like to address the main uh, issue, which has always come up about Newton, well, recently anyhow, about the two Newtons. It's sort of like the two uh, Wittgensteins and all that. Uh, I suggest that that is a, just a totally stupid question. Uh, it's first of all, we are, we are people in space, we're traveling in space, and we're traveling in time. So we're a young man, we grow older, and stuff like that. Our positions change, not only because of our, our own development, but in our context. And sometimes when we're for something, as in our youth, we're totally against it in old age. So like Newton could have been a total, you know, magician when he was young, and then he, as he got older and became more settled in his ways, he just kept changing. I mean, so like we all do, a good way to look at this would be to look at his calculus. Calculus is, is a mathematics, not a static world, but a process. And I would just like to end that thing with one thing about uh, what Gilbert Ryle, uh, an English philosopher said is, Anybody who says that philosophers have positions is stupid. They're always developing their positions. They're always kind of, they're changing. So there's no one position that any philosopher or person, just look at yourself, look at me, look at anybody here. We keep on changing. So that's really not an issue to say that. And he was also a polyglot. So he was involved with all these things. So how the hell is he ever going to brawl it all together? No way. Okay, so see, you know, I I I I feel a great sympathy for what you, you said, and I I think that uh, you know, in a way, uh, you know, Quentin Skinner wrote about uh, you know in his uh, method and interpretation of the history of ideas. He said that, that we have to avoid the myth of coherence, the idea that we can extract from a work a theory. So um, we have to understand what Machiavelli or Locke were trying to do with these works and uh, in a dialogical context and so on and so forth. And the same holds true for, you know, as you say, for a biography, because uh, as you said, Niccolo Ricciardini is not a single thing. I, I am several things in several parts of my life. And even now I am, different things so it's difficult to congratulations to, to say, <laughs> unfortunately i am not coherent uh, but uh, you know we have to accept yes this idea that um, when you write a biography the subject in a way does not exist because uh, newton does not exist and uh, and as you said uh, he changed during his life. And uh, we try to cope with this difficulty by periodization, you know, and, uh, you know, for example, in the case of mathematics, there is this shift at the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s. In the case of religion, there is this interest in the Trinity in the 90s. In the case of chronology, most of the work of chronology is done in London and so on and so forth. I mean, we can periodize. Uh, Newton, and we can also accept Robile's idea that we have to accept that Newton played different roles uh, 
you know, I think that this is a very strong idea, a very interesting idea of one of the great Newtonian scholars nowadays. And I think that, uh, you know, Rob Eilif and also Bill Newman uh, think the same thing. I mean, uh, they say, listen, if you want to understand Newton, the religious Newton, you have to study his religious manuscripts and uh, the same holds true for Bill Newman. What, what, I mean, uh, let's uh, study his chemistry. Now, in, in writing this biography, I had to cope with uh, uh, some sense in which I tried to, to put uh, these things together. So the great challenge for me was to, uh, to when, when you write, uh, you know, otherwise Francois would not have accepted my book if I, if I didn't That's try right. to, to do it. That's so, the style of the time. So you have to make yes. coherence out of it. Yes, yes. But uh, I tried to avoid the, the myth of coherence. I tried to avoid, uh, you know, because I am aware that the best of Newtonian scholarship is very much poised towards um, understanding the several intellectual endeavors of Newton as, as I said at the beginning, as you know, the, the colleague of Bill Newman playing a French horn and uh, teaching chemistry. I mean, uh, uh, we have to accept a certain degree of independence, but, but uh, it is also true that, uh, you know, when Newton writes about, uh, you know, natural philosophy or writes the Principia, a discourse about God enters into that. <laughs> Then in the Principia, he talks about transmutation, <laughs> at least in the first edition, <laughs> talks about, you know, uh, and he ends the general scholium talking about uh, electricity and the ether. So uh, I think that uh, we can, a way to, 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 to write a more unified uh, biography of Newton is uh, placing Newton into his uh, political context because uh, many of his ideas were developed in a very dramatic pol political and uh, religious uh, context. And, on, uh, on, on this note, I, th I think we should uh, give a bit more space for people to ask questions. The next question is from Sarah Hutton and you've just on mute and we have a couple more questions in the, in the chat. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 no. you are right. I, I see the, to yes, interrupt. the, the the equal uh, the time is is flowing equally and and yes. uh, fortunately not <laughs> relatively <laughs> Sarah your question please thank you hello Nicolo that hello, was Sarah. a yeah. wonderful wonderful introduction to your book I have to confess I haven't read it yet but I'm really looking forward to doing so um I want to ask about something which have which hasn't come up yet um although I may say that I think that for the, the Warburg Institute is the very much the appropriate place for a discussion of Newton to be taking place, um, given the uh, given the 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 the, uh, the way it maps knowledge at the in the library. Um, uh, you mentioned earlier that you discuss in your book Newton's networks, and I'm wondering how much you say about his international networks, um, and I'm particularly interested in his relations with Italy. But um, I wonder whether you've got anything to say about that. Well, um, about Italy, I have to say this. I mentioned, you know, it's, it's a short book, this one. But I mentioned two things about Italy. One is this portrait here. Mm -hmm. OK, this is the Kneller 1689 portrait, but it is a copy. And it is a copy, uh, it is a, which comes from Kneller's Atelier, which was found in Lovere, in uh, the Museo Tadini in Lovere. And uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, an analysis of the canvas and also of, uh, of uh, the portrait tells us that this is uh, a copy uh, coming from uh, Kneller's Atelier. And in Lovere, Mary Wortley Montague lived for many years, you see. So we believe uh, that, uh, that uh, this is uh, something that uh, arrived in Italy uh, through Mary Wortley Montague. Um, another thing that is interesting are Francois Jacquier mm. and Thomas Le Soeur, two minimum friars. And I'm, 
side. What I find interesting about these two meanings is that uh, they promoted Newtonianism in Rome. They were Catholics, they were, you know, um, consultori del Sant'Uffizio, so they, <laughs> they very much belonged to the Catholic uh, uh, also censorship, the censor, uh, I mean, uh, the Catholic um, uh, the church, but, but uh, they promoted Newtonianism and uh, in, in their lectures given at La Sapienza, they very much adopted this uh, argument from design I was referring to uh, with Bentley, but they add something. I mean, they say Newtonianism uh, is uh, something that we can accept because it is a natural philosophy that shows us uh, that uh, there is a benevolent and providential God, but the oblate shape of the earth could be caused by the hand of God who presses the earth <laughs> and causes it to be flattened. So don't forget that, uh, yes, okay, the argument from design that Newton uh, proposed is very interesting, but, you know, in, uh, in Catholic Italy, in, in, uh, you know, during the Pope Lambertini's uh, papacy, uh, there was an opening towards uh, the new science, uh, but, uh, you know, there is this argument according to which, uh, in the end, we have to accept that God can intervene, flattening the earth by pressing it uh, at the poles, not because of the centrifugal effect of uh, rotation. So, so, you know, I say something about, you know, the reception of Italy. And um, I must say that I say something also about the women at the beginning. And, and, uh, and there is a portrait um, that you will enjoy. I think very much of, uh, uh, you know, this lady that, you know. Oh, yes. Well, Natalie, yes. <laughs> and then I say something about the reception of, of Newtonianism in the Catholic mm -hmm. as, as an example of the influence that the argument of design, uh, first promoted by Bentley in the Boy Lectures, had in uh, the so called Catholic Enlightenment. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Let me bring, there are some questions in the chat and there's in fact one that I wanted to discuss with you and let me read it first. There is a great debate today about the nature of consciousness. So what it is, where it is located. Did any of Newton ideas relate to this kind of debate? And earlier on, you were speaking about Newton dislike of animism, but at the same time, he believed that matter is animated, but it has movement, but it doesn't have consciousness. So that's my understanding. But if you could comment on, on this uh, query. Yeah. Uh, Quite a delicate point, I, I, I can yes, see. Yes, yes. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. You see, uh, Newton was interested in the works by Willis, for example, on, on the brain. And he was interested in this kind of things. Um, in his use, he dissected the brain of a rodent, for example. So, I mean, he, he was interested in these things. And uh, I, I, I believe uh, that uh, he very much thought, as you said, uh, that matter is animated and uh, that uh, the fact uh, that matter is endowed with active uh, powers is something that can somehow explain uh, you know, perception and volitions and so on and so forth. But uh, Newton was certainly against the idea that uh, uh, this uh, uh, capacity of matter to be animated was essential to matter because, uh, you know, he, he was very careful in trying to avoid a form of animism. I mean, his two great enemies were determinism on one end and animism on the other. And he tried to avoid these two risks. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, um, but, uh, you know, even the Newton, you know, we have, uh, we, we have manuscripts in which Newton thinks about perception, thinks about uh, 
uh, sight and hearing and so on and so forth. I mean, he didn't develop uh, any any any. He didn't develop a theory. Actually, he he left these ideas in the queries to the optics as, as something that has to be uh, understood. But uh, he did not. Uh, uh, produce anything that is that goes beyond us, you know, certain analogies. For example, in the hypothesis on um, on the nature of light of 1675, December 1675, uh, Newton begins to say, well, you know, there is an analogy between sight and hearing because hearing is produced by the vibration of the air. Sight is produced by the vibration of the optical ether that are propagated in the capillamenta of, uh, you know, and, and reach the sensorium. Mm -hmm. And so he speculated about an analogy because he referred to this concept of the analogy of nature, uh, an analogy between sight and hearing. And, uh, it is in this context that, that Newton developed this famous, you know, analogy between the color spectrum and the musical scale. So it is in the context of his interests in perception that he developed these ideas. So, uh, mm, I see. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, there's several in the chat. So you suggested that Newton communicated regularly with others on matters of alchemy. But his reputation in scientific circle is that he was quite secretive. Is it the case that he had these two different attitudes towards communication of his work? And if so, why do you suspect this would be the case? And I think this ties up with a, another question, which is, is it the case that modern sensitivities about the terms occult and esoteric mean that Newton's biblical and alchemical researchers are today treated as somewhat embarrassing for a true man of science. Mm. I mean, basically, on the one hand, you know, Newton being secretive, mm. and on the other, perhaps uh, scholars being secretive about some uh, more esoteric aspect of Newton. No, no um, Bill Newman teaches me that um, Newton, the alchemist, uh, shared with uh, the network of alchemists with whom he got in touch the idea that uh, that uh, you know an adept to to the art had to observe high silence so uh, when he communicated with uh, the other alchemist uh, one is a guy called Wyworth he was uh, you know in, in london uh, he, you know, he he observed this code of behavior in which uh, uh, manuscripts and uh, and materials were exchanged, uh, observing secrecy. So, in in the case of mathematics, um, uh, Newton. Uh, belonged to a community of mathematicians which exchanged ideas via correspondence rather than printing things. And, uh, and um, we have um, a fascinating story to say about the circulation of Newton's mathematical manuscripts in his youth and also in his old age. Actually, this is something that I am trying to do with uh, Scott Mandelbrot, and we meet once a fortnight, trying to see if we can reconstruct uh, Newton's mathematical networks and how he exchanged his ideas. Now, he exchanged these ideas uh, um, in the form of results rather than methods, rather than proofs. Uh, and um, and um, very often the, the exchange that occurred by visiting him in, in uh, Cambridge. So when you look at the, his mathematical manuscripts, what is extraordinary is how tidy they are, how well written they are. 
And uh, some of these manuscripts are stitched. Uh, and we have reason to think that they were shared and circulated first in John Collins circle and then in William Jones circle. So William Jones, uh, the librarian of the Earl of Macclesfield and tutor of the Earl of Macclesfield is uh, another you know, person who um, got from Newton manuscripts and exchanged uh, these manuscripts in a circle that we are reconstructing. James Wilson is another, and Henry Pemberton are uh, two other actors of uh, this uh, uh, story about uh, the circulation of uh, Newton's manuscripts. And uh, reconstructing this problematizes a lot uh, the idea that Newton didn't publish his mathematics for a long time. So it, it's a bit strange, you know, you have this mathematician who obtains all these results and doesn't publish them because he is a fool. No, uh, he exchanged his ideas, but uh, very often he has changed his idea by oral communication. I mean, the story of Halley, who visits Newton in August 1684, is not an exception. I mean, um, other mathematicians, such as John Craig, for example, David Gregory, visited Newton and were given access to his uh, manuscript archive, um, a very generous. Uh, access to his manuscript archive, including, including the religious writings in the case of uh, David Gregory. For example, David Gregory could read uh, the classical scholia when he visited Newton. Uh, he began visiting Newton in May 1694. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Newton's archive, one, a question that we don't understand is why he kept an archive. This is something that, <laughs> that uh, we are trying to understand. And, Something that the archive was useful for was, uh, well, it was useful for Newton because he was working, you know, it was, a, he, he was never at rest, of course, but the, his archive was also something that he could show to people, trusted people who visited him, such as David Gregory. David Gregory could see a lot about uh, uh, Newton's work on mathematics, uh, calculus, but also things related to his uh, views on the ancients, uh, the Prisca Sapienza and, and Newton's uh, religion. So okay, I, I, I think that answers the question. There's a few more questions in the chat and time is passing. So two more questions. The first one, the notion of divining mathematical ideas is an intriguing one. Did Newton decide finally on discovery of new knowledge versus revelation? of existing, but somehow lost or unknown knowledge. Does the illustration in your book from Toussaint de Limogeon suggest a connection with the hidden alchemical knowledge of the Caverna Metallorum? Yes. Uh, yes. Um, okay, that, uh, that manuscript is something that Newton uh, read with the help of Nicolas Fazio de Duillier. Mm -hmm. Nicolas Fazio de Duillier is another actor who uh, allows Newton to get in touch with the French, with a group of continental, mainly French. Yes. And, uh, and uh, there is um, a paper uh, in Muntus, and uh, now I, I don't remember, unfortunately, the name of, um, it is not Palumbo, she is a, a very interesting uh, scholar. And, uh, and uh, she has uh, written a, a very interesting paper about uh, the Nicolas Fazio de Duillier and uh, the networks uh, with whom Newton got in touch. And um, divining mathematics then was a term that was used by Renaissance uh, scholars, Renaissance mathematicians, in order to, uh, to uh, refer to the practice of um, trying to understand from uh, the mathematical works of the ancients, their method of discovery. And uh, the, the Locus Classicus is the seventh book of Papus Collections, because in the seventh book of Papus Collection, Papus says, listen, now I will explain you the method of discovery of the ancients, which is uh, um, written in the three book on porisms by Euclid. And Papus assumed that, that his readers had 
Euclid's porisms in front of their eyes. And this was the method that Euclid used in order to discover new theorems and prove new problems and construct new problems. Uh, so Pappus provided the, the lemmas, the missing bits in uh, Euclid's demonstration. But unfortunately, uh, uh, the porismata are lost, were lost then and are lost nowadays. And we have uh, Pappus, uh, you know, filling the gaps of, uh, of the demonstrations. And so uh, this uh, book, uh, the seventh book of Pappus collection, was uh, you know very intriguing to uh, to the mathematicians of the late uh, uh, 16th century because they wanted to reconstruct the method of discovery of euclid by reading uh, papus uh, work in which uh, you had only the easy steps that um, uh, Euclid had, uh, you know, skipped because they were trivial, you see. So divining the method of, uh, of Euclid in this case meant uh, exercising yourself in this, uh, in this work. But, uh, you know, uh, there were also other things. I mean, uh, the last, the, the fifth, sixth and seventh book of uh, Apollonius were in Arabic. And so Barnard in Oxford began translating from Arabic into Latin the, 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 these important books by Apollonius. And uh, mathematicians such as Newton got in touch with higher Greek geometry this way. Uh, and uh, and um, their interest was an interest uh, that was motivated also by the idea that uh, there were mathematical methods that were important, interesting, and uh, uh, still something of interest for the mathematicians of, uh, so you see how in Newton. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, on this subject, we have a last question from Tessa Murdoch. Hello, um, uh, precisely about mathematician. In fact, you, you mentioned the influx of people after the, the revocation of the AD of Nantes. And uh, do we know whether Newton had any communication with the Huguenot mathematician Abraham de Moivre, si, who was si, London based after the si, revocation of the edict? Si, si. Abraham de Moivre reached uh, England, uh, you know, uh, in the, as a child, they put it, they put him into the box of a violin, you know, they, they, they and and he he reached uh, London like this, and uh, he was a uh, yeah yeah Newton had uh, had uh, had uh, uh, Abraham de Moivre was important for Newton uh, during the controversy with Leibniz because Abraham de Moivre could translate into French uh, the let you know the the works that uh, the Newtonians produced in the context of the Newton Leibniz controversy. And uh, Johann Bernoulli from Basel recognized Abraham de Moivre because his French was the French of the Huguenots, you see, so. And, and, uh, and uh, so, yeah, but uh, Abraham de Moivre played a very important role in the diffusion of uh, uh, Newtonian mathematics in the 18th century. So as always, you know, um, taking a decision in which you compel a religious group to displace in another country is always a great loss. And uh, the Louis XIV uh, lost <laughs> a lot of interesting people <laughs> by, by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. So it's uh, what history teaches us is that uh, it's better not to do these horrible things because <laughs> Abraham de Moivre became a, a, a British mathematician uh, rather than a French mathematician, as you see. Well, on this note, uh, I think that's uh, all we have time for. It's already eight o'clock in Central Europe and seven in London. So it just remains me to uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nicolo, for your time. Thank you, John, for your time and collaboration. This was great quality time. Also, uh, this is the last session of this year, but we will be back next year. And I should thank the Warburg Institute, as well as uh, John Millington for his constant support. So 
Thank you very much, everyone. A beautiful evening and uh, take good care. Good thank night. You. I, I thank you, you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye.